Welcome to the Steady On Podcast, where God's hard truth meets your hard story. I'm Angie Bauman, and this is episode 125, The Superpower of Connection. And with me today is podcaster, therapist, author, and speaker, Karen Hardwick. Karen's passion is teaching on how connection or the lack of connection with others impacts our life. And she firmly believes that connection with others, what I call a horizontal connection, is only possible when we first have a vertical connection, and that is a connection with God. During the interview, Karen talks about how she stays connected to God, which for her involves a two-hour daily appointment with Him. And she says, and I loved this so much, how I do the morning is how I do the day. Now, I recognize two hours every morning may feel way outside your reach right now, I'm confident Karen hasn't always had that routine either. We have the freedom to choose how and when we connect with God, but I do encourage you to hear the invitation in Karen's belief about connection between connection with Him in the early day and how it impacts our connection with other people and ourselves throughout the day. I've chosen a favorite verse of scripture of mine for this episode because Karen mentioned it as a favorite of hers too. It's Zephaniah 317 and it says in the CEB, The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior bringing victory. He will create calm with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Getting and staying connected to the one that creates calm and rejoices over us with singing is a good, good thing. And I know you'll love hearing this message from Karen. Let's listen in. Hello, Steady On community, and welcome into this podcast episode today. I'm Angie Bauman, and with me today is Karen Hardwick. Karen, welcome to the Steady On community. Yeah, I am just so blessed to be here, Angie. Thank you. I can't wait for us to have our conversation. I can't either. This is going to be great. We're going to talk about connection today. We're going to talk about authentic connection and what it means. And I'm just going to start with that right off the bat. Like, what is what is connection to you? Why is it important to you? Why is it a passion of yours talking about people having connection? Yeah, that's a great place to start. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that I'm so interested in connection, Angie, because I've known the pain of disconnection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, whether it was moments of disconnection or seasons of disconnection, even when everything looks good from the outside, the degrees, the house, the career, the whatever else. And I sometimes didn't even know how disconnected I truly was. So I'm just so grateful that a light was shown on that by our loving father. But I also think that connection is so very important, Angie, because from a scientific perspective, we are neurobiologically wired to connect. And so what does that mean? That means we crave connection like we crave water Mm -hmm. or air. And when we don't have it, we tend to create it in ways that are unhealthy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, There's so many different ways that people can connect or think they're connecting, which is really more about numbing or finding people that take advantage of them. So that's really important for us to realize is that we're wired to connect. And then there's this really cool research coming out of Columbia University, Angie, and maybe you've heard about it, but Lisa Miller and her team is discovering that there's some awaken brain and the awakened brain means that we are also wired neurologically to have a transcendent experience. Unpack that a little bit for us, will you? So yeah, that we are wired to have a spiritual experience. Now for me, that is about God, the father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Lisa is saying that the brain is craving a spiritual experience. So given that we are wired to connect that we are wired to have a spiritual connection. And on the basis of my own life experiences, I have come to believe that we cannot connect to other people in healthy, inspiring ways until we learn to self-connect, until we can connect to ourselves in really honest, healing ways. And so that's what I believe connection is. It all starts with self-connection. 
I want to tell, I would like to share something from my life real quick and get your feedback on it. Cause I think this is what you're talking about. And tell me if I'm, tell me if I'm right on the, on the right path. And if I'm not, you know, guide me elsewhere. But I remember in my earlier years, right after my husband, and I've been married, we were married 24 years and I have always struggled uh, feeling very disconnected from my parents. And I would, in, in our early marriage, I would leave time with them. Right. We had, and we had like a 45 minute drive home or something like that. And I would leave time with them trying to show up. And I don't, I didn't know what now I think I was trying to connect, but on the way home, I would usually have one of two responses. I would either cry really hard, like just like sob cry, or I would pick a fight with my husband. Um, and we would argue on the way home about something he had done that I thought created whatever it was I was feeling inside. It took me years to understand and a lot of work that the Lord has done in my heart. And really, I think what you're saying is understand myself and what I was needing that I wasn't getting, what I was looking for, maybe I'll say it that way, that I wasn't getting, that was creating this disappointment. And the only way that I found that I was able to work with that a little bit better was to shift my expectations of what connection was going to look like in that relationship. I don't know. Is that anything close to what you're talking about as you describe connection? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And using that example how painful though, and what courage it takes to say instead, wow, that was really a painful experience with my parents just then or this afternoon. Like I'm coming away from that feeling so sad or as if I'm not valued, I'm not meaning to put words into your mouth, right, whatever no. mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. And so it takes this honest, self-reflective experience, which usually happens, at least from my own experience, which usually happens as a result of some epiphany, some painful experience in our lives. And that's when we start to dig deep yes. into ourselves. And usually God's sitting there saying, what took you so long? Like, I've been waiting for you here. Like, here I am. And that's why I believe self-connection deepens our relationship with God. And St. Augustine said, you know, grant Lord that I may know myself, mm. that I may know thee. So there's this real connection between our self connection and between the spiritual connection. Yeah. And I just share that because I think sometimes when we have like a repeated response, you know, when we feel stuck in our response to something, isn't that a key to maybe asking ourselves those questions and having more self-connection so then we can have a greater connection with God? Oh, I believe that because one of my favorite sayings is nothing changes if nothing changes. And how many times do we feel like we're stuck in this rut or this pattern, or sometimes, and this is really even, and I can certainly relate to this, sometimes we're so stuck, we don't even realize we're yeah. stuck. Yeah. Isn't that true? Absolutely. So the, whole, the problem with unconscious patterns is they're unconscious. They're unconscious. Mm -hmm. So, and then I do believe that only through the healing grace of God, do we start to have some kind of an awakening and so the definition that I land on when it comes to connection, Angie, and it's, it's in my book, is there are three abiding things that work together, that coexist to create emotional wholeness, spiritual strength, and relational well-being. And that's this process of self-discovery that you and I are talking about, which leads to this connection with God filled with grace and healing and redemption. And then and only then are we able to find those healthy connections, those shared experiences that allow us, back to the example of your parents, that allow us to actually feel seen, heard, accepted. And that's when connection is really alive and well in our lives. Hey friend, I'm cutting in right here to let you know my dear friend and ministry partner Jennifer Elwood and I have created something we are calling the Ministry Co-op. It's an online space where women ministry leaders can gather for a community garden approach to ministry. For instance, if you are planting seeds learning Instagram and someone else is planting seeds learning web design, wouldn't it be wonderful to swap that learning so your ministry has more tools? 
that's what we do at the Ministry Co-op. Every member of the co-op has the opportunity to learn in places they haven't yet planted and share from the areas they are reaping a harvest. Each month, we will have a growth emphasis, along with monthly work-alongs and group coaching sessions to help keep you focused and encouraged. Upcoming topics include serving on and leading launch teams, constructing authentic email lists, and speaking for and hosting virtual events. Membership is $60 for one year, and enrollment will be open October 3 through 14, 2022. If you'd like to learn more, you'll find the link in today's show notes. And now, back to the show. And one of the things that I've experienced in myself, yes to all of that, and, and watched in other people too, is when we have a deeper, more dependable connection with God. And I say dependable because of our, our part, like when we know we can depend on it, because we always could depend on it. When we know that, then we are able to not need as much from other people. Like other people can be in our lives who may not meet our expectations, but we're not looking for it from them because we're receiving it through our connection with him. Hallelujah. I mean, amen, a thousand amens to that. And that's when my life started to take on a more peaceful feeling when I stopped hustling for approvals. So Lord have mercy. I, my picture should be next to the Enneagram twos because um, I had this really misguided sense of my own importance. I had this overworked pride. I really thought I could save people and rescue them and fix them. And that be, that was because of very complex grief I carried as a result of the fact that my mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness when I was 10. I became her caregiver and I couldn't save her. And so I started looking for people to save, to rescue, to prove my own lovability, my own worthiness. I had no idea this was going on. This was all, again, so unconscious. Yeah. You know, so I went to seminary and then I went on to, for another master's degree in clinical psychology, all to save people, but not really. It was really to search for this lovability and worthiness. And it wasn't until through a whole series of life events that God was able to, you know, tap me on the shoulder for probably the 1000th time and say, you are beloved, mm. sit with me. Um, yeah, all yeah. those painful experiences, yeah. all those painful experiences, yeah. yeah. Well, talk to us a little bit about how a connection or lack of connection affects our life? How, it, how does it impact our life? How does it maybe impact our work even? Yeah, in so many ways, right? Again, mm, connection for me means that we start to chase slow. Ooh, talk to us more about that. Okay. Say more. We, so we chase slow. And when we chase slow, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of jump to the fruit of chasing slow. It means that we can hear our hearts healing. We can feel our souls sighing and we can feel our lives changing. It's a, it's a life. It's an approach to life that is just so mindful that we're standing on holy ground. So there's reflection and there's silence and there's a sense of stillness and it's purposeful and it's intentional. Um, it's what we're doing here right now. We're chasing, we're talking, but we're so here. We're not worried about anything else. You're not distracted. It's this whole spiritual mindful approach. And until we can give chasing slow that kind of honor in our life, where we find God, where we meditate on his word, life gets really messy. Yeah. I mean, we have never been as a community, as a world so disconnected. We are unraveling. We are collectively grieving. And I do believe it's because we are all having such a spiritual crisis as a collective community. And so that's what disconnection does. It creates, no, I, I don't mean to simplify very complex issues, but it exacerbates addiction, depression, anxiety. 
I believe it's largely responsible for this huge uptick we're seeing in all kinds of violence. Suicide is out of control. All of these things. We're living in a time where we have such access to so-called pleasures and we have never been in so much pain. That is what disconnection does because whatever it is that we're not looking at, Angie, has gone down into the basement and is working out with weights and is getting stronger. So in terms of my own story of addiction and codependency and searching for approval and all of those desperate attempts to feel God's love, that's what I was searching for. I was searching for God's love in all these outside solutions that became part of the problem for me. So my unresolved stuff was downstairs in the basement, working out with weights, getting stronger. And that stuff is going to win until we surrender, turn our lives and our will over to the care of God, right? Until we realize only God can restore us, restore us to sanity. Did you have, yes. Did you have a, a, a moment or a time or a season where you realized that you had the ability to tell that, that thing that was down in the basement, working out and getting stronger, no more. Did you, how, what was that like for you, Karen, as a person to realize I'm actually looking for something that I'm not going to find where I'm looking for it? Yeah, I, I think it was a culmination sure. of just many, many moons of being sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? Um, and there wasn't any big burning bush moment, but there are all these kinds of, you know, life having its way with me that invited me to wake up. So there was a painful marriage. And there was a bout with breast cancer that terrified me because it is what my mother died from. And my son was only 10. And all I could think about was how, Lord have mercy, please. I cannot leave him. Like, I don't want to do to him mm. what I experienced as a child. And then there was, you know, my family struggles with addiction. So there was the walk through addiction and recovery. And that is a brutal, brutal walk. And there was my husband's diagnosis with Alzheimer's. And it all was happening in a very kind of a quick way it was over a period of a decade, all of that. And I think one morning I woke up and said, I, I, I just can't, I, can, I just can't even, I just can't even do this anymore. I was terrified, I was worn out, uh, I was depleted, I was resentful, and I always had this amazing relationship with God, but it became the singular focus of my life. It was this personal, I give up, my relationship with you has got to be my focus. Yeah. So when I was, the day I was diagnosed with breast cancer, a praying mantis landed on me. I was sitting by my pool. My 10 year old son said he had no idea what I, the news that I had just learned. And he said to me, mom, don't hit that. That's a praying mantis. And so right then and there, Angie, it was in that moment that I knew that God was sending some messenger to me in this form of this insect. And so I did some research on praying mantises, wanting to know what the symbolism of them was. And they are a fierce warrior in the insect world. And they marry stillness with strength. And it was right then and there, that was the beginning of a whole new experience of God for me. That was when I started getting up very early in the morning to chase slow, to have a two hour process with God because how I do the morning is how I do the day. Yeah. How I do the morning is how I do the day. I love that. that. I love that encouragement today. And I love your pointing to the praying mantis because 
if we're willing, like God shows up in these huge ways through these small things. Like, I, I mean, I, I watch you, I, mean, I have the luxury for those who are listening, I have the luxury of watching Karen's face as she's talking. And you can tell that even though that was years ago, the, the faithfulness of God is still very real to you in that moment, right? Where this is like, this is God showing up for me today saying, I am with you, whatever that means for the journey that we're on. And I think so many times we miss those messages. Yes. You know, I like to say that Jesus rides shotgun with me. Like seriously, he might get into the car and roll his eyes because Lord have mercy, Angie, it has been a wild ride. Seriously. He's like, oh my gosh, rolls his eyes. <laughs> lovingly just though, right? Lovingly. Yeah. Lovingly. Um, and so that's my girl. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, and I really do believe that he rides shotgun with all of us. It's that personal of a relationship for me now. Yeah. 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 So somebody listening is saying, okay, I hear myself in this description. I hear what Karen and Angie are saying. I know that I'm not living in connected relationships, or maybe even, I don't know if I'm living in connected relationship with God. And so based on what you've studied and your passion and how you help people give us a practical step or two to say, if you realize that that's missing, here's something to do to begin to move you forward in that kind of that self-connection. How, where do we start? How do we get there? I think it's the most courageous work we can do. So I want to say to whoever's listening, you have to be gentle with yourself. This isn't a five step, do this and everything will be well. It's also trusting that you will find your way through this process. Now, having said that, for me, there were three things that really helped. One is this chasing slow that I talked about before. And for me, that shows up in the morning. And it takes two hours typically for me because it takes the heavenly hosts that long to ground me. Seriously. I, I am a handful. So it's a two hour process and there's Bible reading and there's a centering prayer practice and there's journaling. And I read my 12 step recovery literature during that time, which is a very spiritual process for me. So there's all the things that I do and there's certain things I read every morning in my Bible. And then I also ask Jesus to speak to me. So what am I being directed to look at? That's a two hour process. And as I said before, how I do the morning is how I do the day. And it also reminds me of what my first sponsor once told me, whatever conversation you're having, whatever room you're entering into, let God go first. So when you prayed for us before this episode, I was just so very thankful. And it's trying to be as mindful as I can be of letting God go first into everywhere I go. And chasing slow helps me do that throughout the day. So that might be a number one thing to do is find something that works for you. It could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes, right? doesn't have to be. Consistency is the most important thing, yes. I think. Yes. What can you do right now to build that routine in so you're consistently connecting with him? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. Give us Absolutely. another one. Yeah. So two would be do self discovery. Learn as much as you possibly can about yourself. What books resonate with you? What podcasts resonate with you? I believe when I was in graduate school, I was led to all kinds of addiction and codependency work. And I thought that was like, that's for all those other people out there. Uh, I was being led to what I needed to heal. So Pay attention to what you're being led to. I am a big fan of the Enneagram in terms of its deep dive into how we defend ourselves and protect ourselves and how those very things then become self-sabotaging in some ways. I think it's a great spiritual and relational tool. It shines a lot of light on who we are in such a compassionate way. And I would just say, if you're going to dive into the Enneagram, find somebody to guide you through that, somebody who really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So trusted guides are really helpful in the self-discovery process. 
I love that. We're, we talk a lot about the Enneagram in this community. Yeah. I'm a real fan of it. Also, it has taught me a, a great deal about myself and about like my, not my hangups necessarily, but my sort of like go-to things, both good and bad. Right. And you can yes. recognize that and just be a little bit like faster to, for me, I'm like faster to like sort of self-correct sometimes when you're like, okay, this is just a habit of like, I'm a one. And so I have this internal critic all the time, you know, that's talking to me. And sometimes I can just say, that's not a loving voice. Therefore that's not God's voice. So let's remember what God says and try to get out of this place instead of spiraling down in this place. Like you can, you can work this muscle as you're talking about, you can let your inner critic get stronger, or you can stop it from doing the, the, uh, the curls or whatever by speaking the truth of the promises of God over it. Right. Oh, and, and, it, and yeah. And studying the Enneagram yeah. has helped me recognize that in myself. Yeah. yeah it's mm -hmm. a beautiful tool. And yeah. I love that example. You can say, is this the inner critic? Mm -hmm. Is this, or, or the voice of darkness that's going to enslave yeah. me with the lies they want me to believe yeah. yeah, and push me into that perfectionism. So my voice is, you know, the Enneagram is known as two is known as the helper. And so I am wired to help obviously. And I always have to think, am I helping because I'm coming from a place of sacred space where I'm just going to hold yeah. that for somebody or, and this is the slippery slope for me. This is when I start skating just ahead of the cracks. Am I helping because I need to feel worthy? You're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very different, right? Yeah. Very different. Am I, am I striving for excellence or am I trying for me, or am I trying to have perfection so that I'm good enough? Right. Am I good enough? And I want to produce things that are excellent because that's a worthy goal or am I not good enough? And so I'm trying to prove that I have value with it, which is your slippery slope. If you're talking about, and knowing that about ourselves, I think is so helpful as we can sort of check our motivation. And if I may add check our motivation without a doubt, so important, and also approach it all with such empathy for ourselves. Well said. Yes. Right? Yeah. Such mm -hmm. grace because yeah. I can literally say, wow, Karen, you know better. Like, mm -hmm. why did you do that again? Yeah. And there could be this whole big shame Yep. Heap I put on myself, but instead of saying, you know, Karen, you're making strides. You made a mistake take it to God, forgive yourself. Can you move on? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The way you put it is, uh, is so gentle. It's gentler than mine. It, and I say that in like in an, with admiration, you know, because, um, because, because I'm naturally so dang hard on myself, like, you know, and, and I think so many of us are, but, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. I really do. So tell me as you continue to, work towards being more connected with the father, more connected with other people, as you continue to try to encourage other people to be more connected with each other and with the father, do you have a verse of scripture or two that is kind of just something you, it's a go-to for you, something that you go back to again and again and cling to when maybe sometimes when it gets hard? Yeah, I, I have so many go-tos, um, but when rattle a few of them off. That's okay. <laughs> when I was thinking about this, as I was preparing for our chat, because I knew you were going to ask this, um, I pray Psalm 91 every morning and every evening, because in it, I have found such comfort around God's constant protection. So I pray it for myself and my son and my loved ones by name. Um, and that feels so very grounding to me. I also, during this season, especially really have been drawn to the armor of God in Ephesians, mm -hmm. right? In Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And I can actually picture myself and my son, because I'm doing a lot of prayer for both of us as we come out of a really hard season, I can picture the, you know, the belt of truth being put on us and the breastplate of righteousness. And I picture all of that. I'm a very visual person. And then just because I believe in a lot of joy, I like to go to Zephaniah, where he talks about how God's going to renew you in his love and sing over you. Yes. 
Oh. I love that. I think there's one version that says he dances over you with joy. Yes. I, yeah. I can't remember which version that is, but I love that scripture so much too. Someone pointed that scripture out to me several years ago and I've gone back to it multiple times because it's hard for me to believe, but it's in there. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so I just imagine myself like a babe in a crib almost with a, with a, like just ecstatic parent going like, look at this. This is so great. You know, singing and dancing and it's hard for me to receive, but he wants me to. And so I go back to it again to remind myself, this is, this is how he is over us. This is how he is over you. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And this has really helped me. And maybe this will help you, Angie. Um, St. Teresa of Avila was once asked what she does when she prays. I'm going to choke up when I say this. And she said, um, I picture myself being loved. Yeah. I just picture myself being loved. I do love that. Yeah. 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 Where it's just whatever, whatever we are, wherever we are, wherever we're coming to him from, he's just so glad we're with him, you know, like he's always, and he always is because we're always with him but it's when we can pause, I, I'm going to use your words to chase slow. And we sort of crawl up into his lap metaphorically that we're able to receive his gladness that we're with him, right? That we can experience yes. that gladness that we can through connection, as you've said so well, we can really understand that he is delighted in us and he will help us grow as you said too. But, um, but that doesn't change. Those two things are like separate. Like he is just delighted yes. in us. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we really have to, um, cause people talk about fixing themselves a whole lot. I'm like, yeah. mm. Uh, we really don't need to be fixed. We need to accept who we are, where we've been with love and compassion and grace, ask for healing. And of course we would like to evolve, but mostly it's about uncovering all those defense mechanisms so we can connect to our true self, how we were designed to be. Yeah. 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 You said, I, I don't remember if the word you used was brave, I think, um, but I think that this self-discovery is very brave and it's, it takes courage and it does take grace with ourselves and it takes patience. And most of us are pretty bad at that, I would say, right? I just want, I want to be fixed. Just tell me what to do. Um, and that's not how this works, but the, the little bit, well, I don't know, I'd say a lot that I've explored that over the last like decade or so, really trying to understand what makes me tick so that he can better reveal to me the things that can be added or removed from my life to help me be more like him. Is that like the, you know, the more I connect with myself, the more I can receive that from him. It has been worth every bit of angst or strive or, or frustration that it has caused me because I will say, and I think this is part of what your message is. I love my people so much better when I, when I picture myself being loved. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Because to love somebody fiercely can really only happen as we're in the process of accepting our own belovedness. And also as we understand where we end and they begin, like, there's these loving boundaries. There's holding the line. There's letting people have their own self-discovery journey so hard for those of us who, you know, I'll talk about me when I grew up in addiction and codependency to think uh, we're all the same and we're all, you know, I'm responsible for everybody. And that's just not the way it is. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This has been so great. I've really enjoyed talking with you today. I will always ask my guests this question before I let them leave. And that is, would you give us a peek into your life right now as you chase slow and as you seek connection with the Holy Father, what are some things that you are using in that time with him? Maybe a book or a podcast or uh, something you're watching, listening to, reading, anything goes. Karen, would you tell us what, what you might be using right now? Yeah, um, two things came to mind for me, so I'm going to go with those. One is this beautiful song that I was recently introduced to, and it has become my battle cry. It's called belovedness and it's by Sarah Kroger and it's really my theme song right now it's about the pain of addiction and but it can be about anybody overcoming anything 
and it's about owning our own mess, owning everything that we've done to ourselves, the lies that have enslaved us, and learning to own our belovedness. That and sounds like this, a powerful message. Oh, it's, it's such a beautiful song and it's sung from the father's perspective. So the father is singing it. So think about Zephaniah. Singing over us. Sing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I just love it. And in fact, you know, I think I played it three times already today. I know. I, I have some songs like that, a playlist on my phone that sometimes some of the songs will speak to my heart. They can like penetrate my heart in the way that nothing else can, you know, and he, I feel like he brings them, like you're just saying, he brings them into my life to say, this is my message for you in this moment. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love absolutely. That. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one is one of the books that I use in my morning meditation, my chasing slow time is a book called grace looks amazing on you. Oh. I love that title. I don't, don't. It's written by my dear friend, Amy Seifert. It is joyful. It is real. It is Jesus focused. It is all the things so many of us need right now. It's biblically focused. And I, I really actually can't imagine starting my day without it. I love that. I love that. That's a great resource. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for encouraging us. I don't think that this is an easy message because I think it's a message that a lot of people shy away from. We, I think most of us would rather have what you said at the beginning, this is five steps and then you'll be different. You know, this is a journey. This is a message about a journey, one that has ups and downs and it goes slow and fast and it's, it's wonderful and it's painful and it's all those things. And so thank you for continuing to talk to us about how beneficial it is, not, not just for ourselves, but for the places that we lead and work and live also. Oh yeah. I'm so glad you, you know, gave me this opportunity because I learned too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's so good. So, um, so Karen can be found at karenjhardwick.com and I will link that and all the other places that you can find and follow her in today's show notes. Her newest book is called The Connected Leader, Seven Strategies to Empower Your True Self and Inspire Others. And that is out in the world wherever books are sold. I'll also put all of that in today's show notes. And Karen, we cannot thank you enough for just spending some time with us today and serving us. And we're just so grateful for you. I'm grateful for you too, Angie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And friend, thank you for listening. Until next time peace. One of this conversation's takeaways for me is the idea of chasing slow. I want to be relentless in my pursuit of connection with Jesus. And more often than not in my life, that doesn't mean saying yes to something. It actually means saying no to something. So I create more space in my life to hear the song he sings over me. Zephaniah 317 again, this time from the NLT. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Karen's latest book is The Connected Leader, and more information about that and all the places to find and follow Karen are in today's show notes. Next week, Lynita Smith will be our guest. Lynita's debut memoir, Curtain Call, received multiple awards and accolades, and she joined me to talk about coming to a place in her life or what she calls her stage perfect Christian life was interrupted leading to a time of experiencing God inviting her to trust him with her story. Lainita's honesty about the way that season changed her relationship with God touched my heart deeply and I think you will absolutely love listening to her share. If you haven't yet, I'd be so grateful if you would follow the podcast on whatever directory you're using to listen. It only takes a second and it guarantees you'll see new episodes as soon as they drop. Thank you so much for listening. I pray wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.